We are in Luke chapter 15 again tonight. If you'll take your Bibles and make your way there. Luke chapter 15. As we continue our study of the prodigal son, a young man who came to himself and came home to his father. In the morning lesson, we noticed the rebellion of the prodigal son. Tonight, we want to notice the repentance of the prodigal son. As we take a look at the repentance of the prodigal son, it is very likely that as the prodigal son left home, he had no regrets. If he had any regrets at all, the only regret that he would have had is that he had not done it sooner, that he had not left his father's house sooner than he had. But that's all going to change. The far country is not going to hold for him what he thinks it will hold. He one day will be full of regret. His belly will be empty, but his heart will be full. But his heart will be full of regret over the decisions that he has made. There will come the day where he will turn his eyes back in the direction of home. There will come the day where he longs to be there again. You may remember in the Old Testament that we read of a prodigal by the name of Jonah. Jonah was a man who also tried to go to the far country. He wanted to flee to Tarshish to avoid responsibility to his father. You recall that Jonah was called into a, called in a storm of God's sending. He was cast overboard. He was swallowed by a great fish. And he uttered a prayer from the belly of that great fish in Jonah chapter 2. And in chapter 2, we find that Jonah looks back in the direction of home. He looks back to his homeland. He looks back to the temple. He looks back to the place that he's been fleeing from. He looks back to the place, the only reasonable place, where he can expect help. And so it is with the prodigal son. He couldn't wait to get away from home. But the day came when he couldn't wait to get back home. The day came when he looked back to the place that he had most wanted to get away from. And he wanted with all of his heart to be back there again. That's our prayer for every prodigal is that every prodigal will reach the day when they want to be back home. They'll want to be back in the place where they once were safe and sound. As we take a look at this young man's repentance tonight, we're going to see a number of steps involved in it. They are the same steps that are involved in our repentance today, so we can learn a lot from this young man and his journey on the journey of repentance First of all, I want you to consider his reason. Take a look at the text. Our study tonight will begin in verse 17. Verse 17 begins, And when he came to himself. And when he came to himself. You see, in the far country, this young man was not himself. He was not thinking sanely. He was not thinking soberly. He was not thinking as he ought to think there in that far country. There is a certain blindness, there is a certain madness that goes with sin. Individuals that are thinking properly about things do not engage in sin. Individuals who are looking at things as they ought to look at them will not tarry in the far country, but rather will come home. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 3, Solomon says, The heart of the sons of men is evil, and madness is in their heart while they live. And after this they go to the dead. Solomon says, madness is in their heart. We need to look around at the people around us and see those that are engaged in worldly lifestyles and realize that they are deceived. We need to realize that they have been blinded by Satan, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. We need to realize that there is a madness that is at work within their lives. It is the idea of being thirsty and yet drinking salt water to satisfy that thirst. That's what sin is. And yet that's what this young man was doing there in that far country. He was trying to satisfy the longings of his soul, but he was trying to do that with worldly pleasures, and it simply cannot be done. As we think about this far country and we think about this young man, this young man evidently had been shown, if you will, a travel brochure of the far country. Have you ever seen a city or you ever seen a state advertising uh, for individuals to come and to visit there? Uh, They take their attractions and they make them seem greater than they are. They make them seem bigger than they are. Uh, they, They print a beautiful color brochure. 
Don't you want to come here? Wouldn't this be the perfect place for you to live? And sometimes you get there and perhaps it is as advertised. But there are other times when you get there and you realize almost as soon as you pull in, this is not what I expected. This is not what I thought it would be. And Satan hands out travel brochures. Satan says, don't you want to come here? Don't you want to engage in this? Wouldn't this be fun? Now when you get there and when you really take a look around, it isn't as at all as it advertises itself to be. You think about the billboard of young people at a party drinking alcohol. That's the travel brochure. That's Satan saying, wouldn't that be fun? Isn't that where you want to be? Isn't that how you want to be? But when you get there, you realize it isn't like that at all. When you see the wrecked automobile, when you see the diseased liver, when you see the family that's living in poverty, when you see the children or the wife that's been abused and beaten, when you see the loss of the job, when you see the other harm and heartache that comes from that, it isn't at all what you imagined that it would be. But you bought into the brochure. You bought into Satan's picture of what that was going to be like. You know, Paul talks about in Hebrews 3 and verse 13, the deceitfulness of sin. And sin is exceedingly deceitful. Sin promises one thing, but it delivers another. The prodigal son saw the far country, and he imagined one thing, but he found it to be very different than that. And the day came, thankfully, for this young man when the far country didn't hold the allure that it once did. And this young man thought about home. And this young man wanted to go home. Have you ever been homesick? Have you ever gone somewhere and you were there for just a short amount of time and you were, you were homesick? You couldn't get home fast enough. You couldn't get back to your bed. You couldn't get back to your hot shower. You couldn't get back to the places and things that you know and love fast enough. And so it was with this young man. The day came when he wanted to be at home. Now, I'm convinced that when he left home, he didn't think he was ever coming back. He didn't think he ever wanted to come back. He could not imagine that the far country would not be the place where he would live for the rest of his days. The day came when he wanted to be home. So first of all, we see his reason. But in the second place, we see his remembrance. Notice in verse 17. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? Notice that this young man remembers what it was like at home. This young man has taken a job in the far country, working for a citizen of that country, probably a Roman citizen. He has latched on to that individual. He has pestered that individual to the point to where that man finally gives him a job. The job is feeding hogs. And one day, as he's slopping those hogs, he begins to desire what they themselves are pushing from one end of the trough to the other. He's hungry. Very, very hungry. And it is at that moment that he thinks of home. And as he thinks about home, he thinks not about what it was like to be a son in that home. He thinks merely about what it was like to be a hired servant in that home. You see, he's a hired servant in the far country, and so he's thinking on equal terms. He's thinking about what his job is, what his pay is, what his life is like, and then he remembers that his father had hired servants. And his father's hired servants were better paid than he is. He remembers that, that they had bread. He doesn't have any bread. He remembers that not only did they have bread, but they had bread and despair. They were well fed. They even had a reserve for a rainy day. He had none of that. And it was at that moment that that young man said, maybe I could go back and work for my dad. I've ruined this business of being his son. I went to him and I demanded my inheritance and he gave it to me. And I've lost all of that. I'll never be back in that position again. But maybe my dad would hire me. Maybe he would let me work for him. And oh, how much better that would be 
than where I'm working right now. He remembered home. Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 says that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. You see, God has been good to us. And there are days when we're in sin, and there are days when we're in the far country, and there are days when we're in the misery and the pain and the sorrow associated with that kind of a lifestyle that we remember home. That we remember that our Father is a good God. He's a God that loves us. He's a God that's provided for us. He's a God that takes care of people. And it's then that we long to be back there again. In Luke chapter 16, just one chapter later in the book of Luke, we read Jesus. I don't know if it's a parable or not. Some think it is. Some think it isn't. It seems to be to be the way things really are. Uh, parables were based on things that could happen and, and many times things that had happened. But w when we think about the rich man who lifted up his eyes being in torment, you remember that he requested of Father Abraham that Lazarus might be sent to dip the tip of his finger in water and come and cool his tongue. Do you remember what Abraham said to him? He said, Son, remember. Son, remember. Remember that thou in thy lifetime receive good things. It's as if this prodigal is in that pig pen of sin. Father Abraham saying to this young man, Son, remember? Remember what it was like in your lifetime. Remember what it was like when you were back at home. You remember how good your father was and what good things that you received of him. Now, it's interesting in Luke chapter 16 that when that rich man remembers the good life that he had, how he fared sumptuously every day and was clothed with purple and had all the advantages of life, that rich man was in a position to where he could no longer do anything about it. That, that rich man now was, was separated from that life by a great gulf. In fact, he was separated from Lazarus by a great gulf. He couldn't pass from one side to the other. The interesting thing about the story in Luke chapter 15 is that this young man isn't separated by a great gulf. Now, there are a number of miles that exist between him and his father, but they are miles that can be crossed, that can be covered. There isn't this great gulf that's been fixed, that's been set, that you can't get past. This young man has an opportunity to go on. This young man has an opportunity to make something out of the rest of his life. That was already passed in Luke chapter 16 for that rich man. But it was not passed for the prodigal son. And he remembered. He remembered that good life. He remembered those servants that had bread and to spare. There are a lot of things that smell good cooking. I don't know of anything that smells any better than bread does cooking. Bread has a wonderful aroma to it. This prodigal son standing in a pig pen. But he can almost smell that bread. He can almost remember how big those rolls were and how soft they were to the touch. He can almost see the glistening butter on the top of those rolls. He can almost taste one. And then reality hits, but here I am in this pig pen. But that memory has crept in. And that memory is going to motivate him to go home. We ought to be thankful for our memories. We ought to be trying to create memories. We ought to be trying to create memories for our family members. We don't know what the future holds. We don't know whether or not one of our children is going to end up like this young man. It's possible, it's possible for all of us that that can happen. I don't believe in one saved, always saved. And although our children may be saved, the day can come and sometimes does come when they're lost. But I hope, and I know you hope, that you put a memory into their minds. A memory that one day will creep back into their thinking again. 
A memory that will stir them again to turn and look in the direction of home. That will cause them to want to get out of where they are, to get out of the situation, to get out of the mire that they're in, and seek again a better life. And we hope that that gulf will not be fixed when they do so. There's no question in my mind that that rich man in Luke chapter 16 would have crossed if he could have. He couldn't do it anymore. But it should be our hope and prayer that we're planting memories in the hearts and minds of our children that can stir them, if that should ever be the case with them, where they will cross those miles and they'll come home and they'll be faithful to God again. This young man had those kinds of memories of home. But not only should people have those kinds of memories of home, they should have those kinds of memories of congregational life too. Individuals that are not faithful anymore in their attendance, no longer attending the services of the church, what kind of memories do they have of the time when they were here? What kind of memories do they have of the people that still worship here? Do they remember the fellowship meals that we had together? Do they remember the fun that we had together? Do they remember how much we enjoyed being around one another? Do they remember how much we loved one another and cared for one another and prayed for one another and served one another and encouraged one another? Do they remember that? Because if they don't have those memories, there's not very much to pull them back. But if they have those memories, maybe one of these days, one of those memories will creep in at just the right moment and they'll look toward home and they'll make the decision like this young man did to finally come home. Think about in the third place his resolution. Notice in verse 18. I will arise and go to my Father. I will arise and go. The prodigal son made a resolution. And his resolution is I'm going to get up and I'm going to go. I'm not going to spend the rest of my life here. I'm not going to stay stuck in this mire for the rest of my days. I'm not going to be feeding these hogs for the rest of my life. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go. This prodigal son has come to the conclusion I've already spent too long in the far country. It's already cost me too much. I don't need to spend another day here. I need to get up and I need to go. And based on the reading of the text, that's what he did. He got up and he went. He didn't waste any time getting out of here. Once he changed his thinking, once he had that remembrance of home, he said, I'm going. And he went. What was there to hold him there? I've told you before the story of the young man knocking on the pig farmer's door. And the young man tells the pig farmer, I'm going home. And the pig farmer says, Your father will take one look at you and he'll send you back. And the boy says, You don't know my father. Our father isn't one who sends us back. Our father's one who says, I'm so glad you're home. I've been watching, waiting, I've been praying, I've been longing. For you to come home. Think about the song that we sometimes sing. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by sin. This young man was resolved no longer to linger in the far country. He had set his eyes on something higher. He had set his eyes on something nobler. He was coming home. And nothing was going to stop him from coming back to his father. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5, the church at Ephesus was told to remember from where they had fallen, to repent, and to do again the first works. That's exactly what this young man's going to do. He remembers where he's fallen from. He used to be there. Now he's down here in the mire of sin. He's repenting of where he is, of what he's done. And he's going to go back and he's going to do those first works again. 
This time, in his mind, he's not going back to do those first works as a son. No, he sacrificed that, he's given that up. But he'll go back and he'll do those first works as a servant. And he'll be thankful to be able to do that. Sin has opened his eyes. And he's resolved to go home and again be what he needs to be. And let's think about his responsibility. Notice in verse 18. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. He plans out what he's going to say. And here's what he's going to say. I have sinned against heaven and against thee. This young man is taking responsibility for his actions. He's saying, I'm in this mess because of bad choices that I made. It's interesting that he is not blaming his father for being in the far country. He's blaming himself. In Matthew chapter 25 and verse 24, we read the parable of the talents. Five talents, two talents, one talent. And you remember that the one talent man went and he hid his talent in the earth. And when the master came and inquired concerning that talent, do you remember what he said to the master? I knew that you were a hard man. And I knew that you, 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 you reaped where you didn't sow. You see, it's your fault that I didn't do anything with this. Because you're such a hard man. I've heard young men say about their fathers, he's a hard man. On occasion, that may have been true. On occasion, it may have been true that someone was harder than what they should have been. We don't need to be that way. We need to be like God. But I've also known fathers who are softer than what they should have been. Who don't demand enough. Who don't require enough. But this young man doesn't say, Dad, you were just too hard on me. And that's why I ended up here in the, in the far country. He doesn't blame his father. He doesn't see it as his father's fault. He realizes that it's his fault. He realizes that he's made foolish choices. He doesn't say that his father's driven him to the far country. He doesn't say to his father, you've shown favoritism or you've been unfair. It's interesting that the elder brother who never leaves his father's house accuses the father of favoritism. He says, you never gave me a fatted calf. You did it for him just as soon as he's come. There wasn't even a probationary period for him. He walks in and you instantly go and kill the fatted calf for him. You've never done that for me. You, you're being unfair with me. You're showing favoritism for this one who's wasted your living with harlots. You prefer him over me. It's interesting, and we'll get to it, Lord willing, in, in a later lesson. This elder brother, when his father comes out to entreat him, he says, Look! Look! I want you to know that I've served you like a slave all these years. I want you to know that you've treated me like a slave. And you've never given me the benefits you've given to him. This younger son doesn't say that to his dad. This younger son says, I have sinned. He understands that the fault is his. This young, young man doesn't come home to his dad and say, you have sinned. You know, that's the philosophy of our age, right? If, if young people do something wrong, whose fault is it? Well, it's their parents' fault. Somehow their parents are to blame for their actions. Sometimes maybe the parents had a part in it for not training them, not teaching them. But sometimes they were trained. Sometimes they were taught. Sometimes they just made foolish choices. That's what this young man did. I want you to understand something. I don't ever want you to miss it. And you won't be judgmental with other people anymore. 
The Father in this parable is God. You had better be slow about saying this Father did something wrong. This Father didn't do anything wrong. And he still had a son that ended up in the far country. Now, if, if you want to argue with that, go ahead. But it doesn't change the fact that the father in this parable is God. And he could not have been a better father than he was. Serious, isn't it? Scary, isn't it? That's what this parable says. But think about this young man. He doesn't come home and he doesn't say, You have sinned. He comes home and he says, I have sinned. He doesn't even come home and say, We're both at fault. Uh, we need to clear the air, Dad. You see, there was some wrong on your side and, and there was some wrong on my side. Let's just reach a compromise and, and, and agree that both of us were wrong and both of us will do better. In this parable, the father was not at all at fault. He had done nothing wrong. The full blame fault was on the part of this son. And this son was courageous enough to say it. I have sinned. Now it should also be noted that this young man doesn't come home and blame his brother. Now later on we're going to read about his brother and, and his brother's deserving of some blame. This young man could have come home and said, My brother's a hypocrite. And it would have been true. This young man could have come home and he could have said of his brother, My brother is judgmental and mean. And it would have been true. He could have come home and said, My brother is... And fill in the blank, and it likely would have been true. But it would not have changed the fact that he was responsible for his own actions. You see, even if your brother is a hypocrite, he's not responsible for your sin. Even if your brother is judgmental, he's not responsible for your sin. That's his sin, he'll answer for it. But he's not responsible for yours. You take responsibility for your own actions. This young man does that. He says, I have sinned. He doesn't say my dad has sinned. He doesn't say my brother's sinned. He said, I have sinned. He doesn't come to the front and say, I've done some things wrong, but so have all of you. He didn't do that. He says, I've sinned. And he owns up to his sin. He takes responsibility for his actions. One day we'll have to do that. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. But something else I like about the statement that he makes is he says simply, I have sinned. He doesn't put that little word if in there. We like to put that little word if in there. We like to hedge a little bit. We like to come forward and say, if I have sinned. This young man didn't come home and say, Dad, if I have sinned. He didn't do that. There wasn't any if about it. He had sinned. He knew he had sinned. He didn't come home and say, if I've said something or if I've done something that's offended you. He doesn't do that. Because he has said that which has offended his dad. He has said that which has done wrong to his dad. There's not a question about it being if. If you're going to walk down the aisle and make a confession, and if you have to put that little word if in there, I'm going to suggest you wait before you come down. I'm going to suggest you wait until you can get that little word out of your confession. When you can get it out of your confession, then you come down. But as long as that word's in there, as long as you're hedging, you're not ready to come forward. You're not ready to come forward until you're willing to do what this young man did and say, I have sinned. I'm wrong. Not my dad, not my brother, not anyone else. I am at fault. He was willing to do that. We have to be willing to do that. In Leviticus chapter 5, in verses 17 through 19, there's an interesting situation in the Mosaic Law where a person transgresses the law. And yet he didn't even know that he was doing that. 
But the Mosaical law said of that man that he was guilty. And then it uses this expression concerning him. It says that he had certainly trespassed against the Lord. Here's a man who does something against the law of God. He doesn't even know that it's against the law of God, but he later learns that it is. The Bible says that he had certainly trespassed. You see, even that man in that situation didn't say if. He said simply, I have. God's law said that was wrong. You did it. You're guilty. You've sinned. Don't try to hedge. Don't try to say, but, but, I, I didn't. No, no. God's law said don't do it. You did it. You have certainly trespassed. You own up to your sin. You deal with your sin. You get forgiveness of your sins. Notice what this young man says. He says that he sinned both against heaven and against thee, against his father. Those two are linked together. Exodus chapter 20, for example, Ephesians chapter 6, both teach children, honor thy father and thy mother. Heaven gave that commandment. To disobey that commandment is to sin against heaven as well as against your parents. This young man had done that. He had sinned against his father and what he said to his father, what he did in relation to his father. But in sinning against his father, he had sinned against heaven. Because heaven had commanded him to honor his father. He didn't do that. Heaven had commanded him to treat his father with certain respect and he had not done that. He had sinned against heaven as well as against his father. And notice which one's listed first. Notice that heaven is listed first. Ultimately, all sin is first and foremost against God. You might want to notice Psalm 51 for just a moment. Notice how David put it. David said it two times. He also said it in 2 Samuel chapter 12 when he's confessing his sin there. But David understood this. He said in Psalm 51 and verse 4, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Against thee and thee only have I sinned. Now David's talking about the sin that he committed with Bathsheba. Was that sin not against Uriah? Was it not against Bathsheba? Was it not against David's wife? Was it not against David's own body? Was it not against society? It was a sin against every one of those individuals. But David said, against thee, thee only, have I sinned. Now, what does he mean by that? He means, ultimately, God, I sinned against you. Ultimately, you're the one that I've wronged in all of this. You remember that Joseph was tempted by Potiphar's wife. And Joseph says, how can I commit this evil against God? That would have involved her, it would have involved her husband, it would have involved all that knew Joseph, it would have involved Joseph's family. But Joseph said, how can I do this in sin against God? He understood that ultimately it was the sin against heaven. We need to understand that about sin as well. But let's take a look at his remorse. Notice the remorse that this young man has. He says, I will arise and go, in verse 18, will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Verse 19, And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hard servants. Notice what he's planning on saying to his father. I'm not worthy to be called your son. I have shamed your name. I have brought shame upon this family and I don't deserve to ever wear that name again. I'm not worthy of it. I'm just asking that you'll make me one of your hired servants. Notice the remorse that he has, the attitude that he has. Do you remember when he left home? You remember that when he came to his father in verse 12, he said, Give me. But in this passage in verse 19, he says, Make me. There's a different attitude there. One is, I am entitled. 
I deserve this. These are the goods that fall to me. These are the goods that, that I deserve. These are the goods that belong to me. I've earned these. Give them to me. But that's not the attitude when he comes home. The attitude when he comes home is make me. He's not asking to be a son. He's not even asking to be a slave. He's asking to be a hired servant. That's as low as they go. A son has all kinds of rights and privileges. Even slaves have some rights and privileges. Even slaves have some security in that position. A hired servant doesn't have that. A hired servant comes to work for today. And you may not rehire him tomorrow. He'll come looking for work tomorrow, but you may not have anything for him. He lives literally from day to day. This young man says, just give me a job for today, and I'll come back tomorrow, and I hope that there'll be another job for me then. He just wants to be a hired servant. Notice the attitude that he has, how humble he is. Think about Genesis chapter 32 and verse 10. I love the language of Jacob. Now, Jacob wasn't always as humble as what he should have been. But in Genesis 32 and verse 10, he makes this great statement. He says, I'm not worthy of the least of all of thy mercies. He says, God, I'm not worthy of your mercy. I'm not even worthy of the least of all of your mercies. God, if you could sort out all of your mercies and you could find the smallest possible mercy, I'm not deserving of that morsel of mercy. I'm not worthy of it. That's what this prodigal son is saying when he comes to his father. He comes to his father and he says, I'm not worthy of even a morsel of mercy. I don't deserve it. Just hire me for the day. Just give me a job for today. In Luke chapter 7, in verses 6 and 7, we have a Roman centurion who, who had come up through the ranks of the Roman army. He was a man of authority. He was a man who was highly respected. He was a man, no doubt, of some means. But he comes to Jesus on behalf of a servant. And he says to Jesus, I'm not worthy for thee to come under my roof. Here's a great man in many ways, but he says, I'm not worthy, Lord. But not only does he say, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof, he says, I'm not even worthy to come and bring this request to you. That's the attitude that he had. That's the attitude that this young man has when he comes home. It's the attitude that all of us ought to have. Now, the prodigal son wants to be a hired servant. But the interesting thing about this is this. He's a hired servant in the far country. Some, someone says, well, why, why would he want to come from the far country all the way home just to be a hired servant? Because there's a difference in the hired servant of a Gentile and the hired servant of a Jew. There's a different in, difference in the way that he's treated there and the way that his father's always treated his hired servants. He's wanting what the pigs are eating, but his father's servants have bread and to spare. And besides that, if he goes to work for his dad, one thing that he can be sure of, he's not going to be slopping hogs. Father doesn't have any hogs. That's not going to be his job. Now, he may have the job of washing feet, but he's not going to have the job of feeding pigs. And he's had all that he can take of that job, and at least he'll have a new job. But let's talk about a final point. The lesson will be yours, and that is the prodigal's return. Notice in Luke 15 and verse 20, just the first part of the verse, it says, And he arose and came to his father. He arose and came. You remember what he said, I will arise and go. That was his resolution. But we all make resolutions, right? We make resolutions come January the 1st, I'm going to go on a diet. January the 1st, I'm going to start an exercise program. January the 1st, I'm going to get organized. January the 1st, I'm going to do... And we have all of these things that we're going to do. And yet, two weeks, three weeks after that, we've already abandoned all of those things. We resolved to do them, but we didn't follow through with them. Realize that this young man resolved in the far country... I'm going to arise and I'm going to go home to my father. And he actually did it. 
He actually followed through with that resolution. How many people do we go and visit who aren't attending the service of the church? We go in and we sit down on their couch and we talk to them and visit with them and we talk to them about the fact we've been missing them. And you know what they'll tell me? What they'll tell you? I'll be there Sunday. Sunday rolls around and we look. And sadly, more times than not, they're not here. They resolved when we were there talking with them, I'm going to be there Sunday. But they didn't follow through with that resolution. The question for you tonight is, what resolutions do you have? And are you following through with those resolutions? There are people in this audience tonight who have resolutions to respond, repenting of their sins, to quit living the way they're living, and to start living for Christ. There are people that have those resolutions in all likelihood who are here tonight. But is it just a resolution that you have that you're never going to act on? Or is it a resolution like this young man's resolution that you're actually going to get up and do it? What time is there like the present to follow through with it? The journey of a thousand miles, we're told, begins with a single step. And that's true. This young man's journey home began with a single step. Your journey tonight of a thousand miles from the far country of wherever you are can begin tonight with a single step of your stepping out, walking down that aisle. I want you to think about something. You know, the hardest thing in life to do is to go back to the place where we failed. It's the hardest thing to do. To fail in doing something and have to go back to that place. One of the hardest things that you'll ever do if you do it correctly is walk down that aisle and sit on that front pew and say, I've sinned. Because what you're doing is you're saying, I failed. This young man left home. Everybody saw him leave. He left home whistling a song. He left home with these dreams of the far country and what it was going to be. And now he's coming home smelling like a hog. His clothes are dirty and worn. Think about the shame as this young man walks back into town. But he's resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delights. I can't make that walk down the aisle easy for you. If it was easy, we might not take seriously what it means to be a Christian. It's not easy. It's hard. There's shame associated with it. Rightfully so. But I can tell you this, and I learned it from this parable. The Father's watching for you. And this Father saw his boy walk into town and he couldn't get to him fast enough to cover up those rags with a robe. He couldn't get to that hand fast enough to put a ring on it. He couldn't get to those feet fast enough to put shoes on them again. He couldn't kill that fatted calf fast enough to prepare this great reception for his son. If you will but step out tonight and begin that journey of a thousand miles, God, as the loving Father of this parable, will run to meet you and to cover you with that robe. He's willing to cover your shame if you're willing to come in humble submission to His will, saying, I have sinned. I'm not worthy to be called thy son. 
Just, just take me on as a hired servant. That's more than I deserve. Are you willing tonight to humble your heart in that way? If so, we invite you to come, either to obey the Gospel by believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repenting of those sins, confessing Christ as God's Son, being immersed in water for the remission of your sins, Acts 2 and verse 38, or as a child of God who's gone to the far country, as a child of God perhaps that's been in this auditorium, but your attitude has been an attitude far, far away from the attitude that should be in the Father's house. Whatever your sins are, come, if you need to, as we stand and as we sing.